So welcome to tonight's Dharma study group. Our topic tonight is the gunas, and I like to call it a, a methodology for organized transformation. Transformation doesn't always feel organized. Sometimes your life is being transformed and it's a surprise to you. Other times you think you're going to transform your life in a certain way and you might have a sense you're going to be in charge of that and it takes its own left or right turn. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about these tonight, these gunas, as how to leverage the, the skill and strength of each for organized transformation. I'm not saying that it's going to go smoothly every time you have transformation in your life, but this is a, one lens to look through for that. So to get ready, we're going to sit quietly. I'll bring the spell. And as it goes to silence, so will we. As we sit quietly together, welcome your mind to also come to quiet. It's not always easy, and yet if you invite your mind to quiet, you may find that it responds kindly. If you notice that your mind doesn't come to quiet very easily this evening, you may give it something tangible to kind of hold on to, something tangible to rest in. I invite you to bring your awareness to the places right now where your body is making contact with the ground beneath you. And as you come into deliberate relationship with those sensations, just know that sensation occurs in the present moment and invites us to be here in this preciousness To become aware of where you connect with the ground beneath you is to give your mind a simple place to touch down. Also means it implies that you're not now grasping to finish any particular thoughts. Sometimes I like to say, for right now, no thought 
is important enough that you have to think it to its end. Return your mind to noticing where you connect with the ground. And for any moment where your mind wanders away, just quietly usher it back. Pay attention to how you usher your mind back. What is the nature of your voice tone with yourself? What is the nature of your response to your mind? And join your hands together. So as we transition from quiet sitting to conversation, if you find your mind gets distracted, daydreamy, reactive, come back to noticing where you make contact with the ground. With appreciation for your efforts to be here tonight, you may bow your head to your heart. Release both hands and open your eyes. <clears throat> so in the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, we are introduced to the concept of the gunas. That's spelled G-U-N-A-S. Looks like this. And the word guna can be translated to mean strand. I like to think of it like the strands of a braid, like how Jerome has the hair braided. I wasn't someone who mastered braiding my hair in early life, and now I don't, I don't think to do it. But if you watch how braids get woven together, the pieces are coming together, making a whole. The gunas as strands, aspects of nature, are like those braids. They weave in and out of each other, and they make a whole. There are three gunas. These, 
determination on the numbers from the perspective of yoga happened way before I started studying yoga. So I smiled at that when I said there are three gunas because there are also three doshas. And people often try to put those two things on top of each other. Let me recommend that you don't try that, that you let the doshas be the doshas and the gunas can be the gunas. It's easy to consider, oh, this one would go with that one and vice versa, but you start making some doshas better than other doshas. And the fundamental fact is these are all elements of nature moving and interacting. And the three doshas come out of the five elements, and that's a different conversation. So we're going to focus on the three gunas tonight, the three strands. We're introduced to these in the Bhagavad Gita because our uh, main character, Arjuna, is getting some lessons from his teacher about the way the world works. Now I'm going to talk about these aspects of nature like temperaments in the human system. They also exist in nature. So if you put them together, like many people write them in this format, so you'll see Thomas. <coughs> Tamas is spelled T-A-M-A-S. You'll see Rajas here. <coughs> and then they tend to put Sattva up here. And often the illustration that's drawn looks like a pendulum. So that you're, you're sort of swinging back and forth between the options of Tamas and Rajas. But this is a misunderstanding and I I smile at that misunderstanding because I can see how Western mind likes to think. Actually, I have Western mind conditioning, so it's not that I see it, I feel it. And Western mind likes to say that sattva is the best, and then we swing back and forth between tamas and rajas. But all three of these energies are moving in nature. They're all moving, they dominate different times of day. In fact, one of the beauties of Indian music is that some ragas are meant to be played during the tamasic times of day and some during the rajasic times and some during sattvic times. Ragas are based on the season, the time of day, the weather, and it's beautifully organized according to what's happening, so the music is very much connected to nature. These are elements of nature. So if we put it on the pendulum model, let's look at it through the Western mind first and then I'll give you a different way to look at it. Tamas means that which is stable and also that which is inert. Has anybody in the room struggled with inertia in your life? <laughs> towards making change or taking care of things? Some may have the inclination to struggle with inertia. Some may be on the other side of this pendulum, quote unquote pendulum. So tamas is stable and inert, which is fine and lovely. When it goes out of balance, however, stable can become stuck. It can become less changeable, less malleable, less able to be transformed. So we need tamas because we need stability and structure. I'll put structure in here like this. In fact, when I work with people in, in my uh, private practice here, when I work in group sessions as well, I mean therapy sessions, one of the things that's commonly out of balance in Western American life is that what has become tamasic in our lives are the wrong things. What has become rajasic are the wrong things. So where we are tamasic is where we ought not be tamasic. That means what's become stable, what's become routinized, what's become habituated is causing dullness, is causing stuckness, is causing more lethargy, not more luminosity. So if tamas is your structure, a healthy structure from a yoga perspective requires certain aspects in the daily routine. But some people's tamasic behaviors are like this. They know they wake up in the morning at a certain time. They know they have caffeine. They know they turn on the news. They know they have the email. They know they have the commute to work. They all already predict and expect these things as their daily routine. They know when they get done with work, they have the alcohol, they have the other emails, they have the Facebook, <laughs> they might have the TV, they might have the same routines when they get home. It means open the front door check the mail, turn on the remote, open the fridge, and stand in front of it while eating. Has anybody done that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just honest. So those routines, when they become that routinized, they're called stuck. Because if the habit is difficult to change, if it's become that ingrained, it's tamasic. 
even if the habit includes some movement, like I go to the caffeine and I feel wired, I go to the email and I'm getting a lot, quote unquote, done, it's the stuckness that's problematic. It's the habituation into dullness, into unconscious habit. That's called tamasic. One of my teachers is Eknath Eswar, and in his translation of the Bhagavad Gita, he starts in the induction associating tamas with what Carl Jung referred to as the unconscious. So that which also is tamasic can get stuck in the, in the dark, in the unconscious, in the subconscious. It's, we're not bringing freshness to our relationship with it. So tamasic mind is the unconscious repository of habituation. Tamasic body is when it feels lethargic and stuck and dull. Tamasic life is when the routines aren't changing very much. Even if you have a whim to change them, you find the undertow of tamasic behavior is stronger than your will to make change. Does that describe tamas okay? You understand? Now, if tamas, we were using it auspiciously, tamas would represent that structure that provides the container in which we experience transformation. So this illustration already doesn't work as a pendulum. So you'll understand when we get to the next illustration. So rajas over here, rajas is mobile and it's energized. So mobile and energized is fine and lovely like right now. Did you hear the birds singing earlier? That's what rajasic, they're having their energized, expansive, flitting about time. They're doing it during the sattvic period of the day, the sun was setting. That's considered a sattvic experience. When the sun is at its highest point, it's a rajasic time of day, when the most energy is moving, the most heat, the most um, vibrancy, the most activity. Cities are more rajasic by nature, for example, when they have a lot going on. So that which is mobile and energized, when it goes out of balance, I describe that like chaos, like the Tasmanian devil. My teacher, Saraswati, who's in Chennai, she describes the mind like this. I was telling a group of this recently, another group of people. She described the Western mind, the Indian mind, the conditioned mind, the anywhere on the planet mind that's out of balance. She says it's like a drunken monkey stung by a scorpion haunted by ghosts. <laughs> that's how she defines the nature of the out-of-balance mind. That's a rajasic mind, a drunken monkey stung by a scorpion going crazy, haunted by ghosts. So when the mind goes out of balance like that, it's really hard to leverage rajas for the purpose of transformation or change. We need enough energy to take care of things. We don't need to be chaotic and anxious and, and out of control like that. Sattva up here <coughs> is considered that which is lucid that which is true and luminous. That's why Western mind likes to make this illustration with sattva on the top, like this. And the, the, uh, the goal actually is to become more sattvic as a person, to balance the energies of tamas, rajas, and sattva. You'll experience yourself more often in that which is lucid or luminous. But the out-of-balance aspect of sattva also exists. That is, when people move off into the ethers, when they're disembodied, disconnected, detached, dissociated, they're, like, they're moving away from the, the ability to be embodied, which is tamas. They're moving away from the ability to engage with the world, which is rajas. So each of these we need. We need to, to honor the structure of embodiment that we have, this dense thing called the physical body. By the way, it's a lot more dense than your mind. You might feel your mind is more dense than your body because it's often more problematic, but the body's more dense than the mind and less likely to change. So it has the structure of tamas. And then we have the mind here. We need enough motivation to do something. And if those two things are disconnected and you're up in the sattvic ether clouds, that's not a better place to be. It's usually an escape hatch that people go to. So what I've seen in, in this model, we'll just talk about it for a few minutes more, is that some people hover right around here on the tamasic side of the spectrum, and some people hover over here on the rajasic side of the spectrum. Now, each of us likes our comfort zone. I mean, do you like your comfort zones? Mm -hmm. You get used to them? You know how to get back to them? 
Is that right, Tom? So if this is this person's comfort zone right here, and this is this person's comfort zone here, they're having their own mini pendulum. So when this person on the rajasic side goes far enough into their excess rajas, they start getting uncomfortable. And they bring their own pendulum back a little bit more towards tamas. That might mean like this. person's life is really chaotic, they're really anxious, they're very busy, they're getting things done, they're driving around town, they're feeling out of control, they need some downtime, they say, I'm going to have a massage. I'm going to get some acupuncture. I'm going to take a hot bath. And they're going to get still or help themselves get still by the support of a massage therapist and so on, so they can feel more of their tamas, more of their grounding, more of their stability. And they have enough stability after the massage, they say, oh good, I'm going to get more things done. And they go back to activity. Is this describing anybody in the room? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Holly, did you say yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the tamasic person isn't actually better off, so we ought not practice envy in either direction. The tamasic person, they may be just laid back enough, super laid back, that they tend towards, on their tamasic side, postponement or dismissal or there's always more time later to get something done and another Netflix episode seems like a good idea and the phone calls, there's too many to make and they start feeling, out of, even out of their own tamasic nature, they start feeling out of balance tamas. They say, I need to get something done. So they might get up and clean the house, open the windows and feel a little bit better, answer a couple emails, pay some bills and clear the to-do list a little bit. Say, oh, what a relief, I feel so much better. And then they can settle back into the tamasic habits again. Does that describe anybody? <laughs> Did you raise your hand for both of those things? No. Oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> so our little hover zone tends to be our personal hover zone. And people have one up here too where they're, they might go into their sattvic out of balance just enough. Like they like to float above the world. It's a difficult place to live. So a little floating can feel like a nice thing to do, but if you're floating and you start floating even farther away, you might feel disconnected from people or humanity or the, the day-to-day routines of life. And you think, I really ought to get more connected. And that person might drop in for a few minutes to conversation or they might eat some protein and <laughs> get more grounded or like, do a headstand and feel a little bit more on the planet here. They say, oh, that was nice to visit for a little while. And then they might hover back up to the more dissociated, lucid, out-of-balance sattva, like a disembodied experience. Anybody relate to that one? (laughs) Yeah, so each one of these has their sort of shadow side, the liability. They all have assets too. I'm not fond of the pendulum model because it posits that sattva is better than tamas and rajas and it suggests that these two are in um, conflict with each other, but they're not in conflict. They're strands of energy. They're gunas woven together. Now, if tamas represents in the human mind that which is more unconscious, rajas represents that which is greedy, aggressive, hungry, the materialistic, consumeristic perspective that we live with here in the West. (coughs) It represents the grasp for things and objects. This represents that repository of unconscious human behaviors. And sattva would represent what is intelligent and refined and elegant. So in that regard, it is better to have a sattvic mind rather than a rajasic, greedy mind or a tamasic, dull, um, sort of unconscious mind. So if you think about your mind states can be rajasic, tamasic, or sattvic. And I'm going to give you a different model to look at this with because I'm not fond of the pendulum system. So this model looks like this. Many of you have seen this drawing before. What do you think this is a picture of so far? Kettlebell. Mm-hmm. Somebody said toast, right? Toaster. Toaster, yeah. Kettlebell, yeah. Now what is it? It's a tea kettle. Yeah, it's a tea kettle. But somebody, even though I had this spout on here a couple of years ago, somebody still thought this was a toaster. So that's how it turned out. It's the lever, yeah. The, the lid. Oh. 
How's that? Okay. All right. So this is an illustration of the wise use of rajas, tamas, and sattva. So let me explain here. So underneath the red is the fire, which is rajasic. So this represents rajas, that is the force of motivation, the heat required for transformation. It's that which is mobile and that which is capable of moving one substance into the form of another substance, rajas. The tea kettle represents the force that is tamas, the structure has to be stable enough to hold the water. If the tea kettle has a lot of leaks in it, a lot of pock marks, the water is going to be flowing out and putting out the fire. So let's say that some of you who said you're more tamasic by nature, you have a container like this, but it has a lot of little pinpricks in it, and it causes the water to flow out of the teapot this way. So it's flowing out and down, as I'm drawing here. And that water is putting out the fire, which is your motivation. So your tamas is drowning your rajas. Do you understand what I mean by that? No, can you use one more illustration? So if you, used, if you, were, if you were saying that is the water, so in our life, that would be the, what, the motivation? <coughs> the water is the motivation? No, the motivation is the fire. Okay. So let's think of water for a few minutes as a tamasic element when it's ice. Okay. When ice is frozen, it becomes stable. Okay. When water is not frozen, it's mobile. Okay. So tamas out of balance is when something becomes frozen, unchanging, stuck. We need structure. So the teapot <coughs> here represents the tamasic structure. Oh, so it's more the tea kettle than the water. Okay. Yes. The water is the element that we're going to transform here. But even if we had ice cubes in this teapot, if we could melt them, the ice transformed into water has more power. This is as, like if you watch the iceberg melting and then it becomes a river, that's a pretty strong force going downstream. So here, if your teapot has a number of holes in it, these tiny pinpricks, they cause the water to flow out. And therefore, the teapot becomes dry and the water puts out the fire. So your tamas drowns out your rajas. And these pinpricks are your thoughts. The countless ways in which you think unconsciously, subconsciously, habitually. They're the countless tiny thoughts that cause you to stay in habit. They're the thoughts about what we like, what we don't like. The thoughts about the past and the future, self and other. They're the countless ongoing thoughts that keep us suspended like as in stuck, in what we've been doing, in what we know, in what we've patterned ourselves to do. Do you understand what I'm saying about that? Mm -hmm. Sarah Joy, <clears throat> um, Jerome got, brought up a good point, I'll bring it up for her. So on the, the Thomas Rajas Sapa, these are the kind of the states of mind, yes? That they can be states of mind. These categories mm -hmm. that we've talked about before were the states of mind? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar. So we're looking at five mind states in the Yoga Sutras to go back to what you asked earlier. And they're disturbed, dull, distracted, one-pointed, and lucid. Tamas is more dull. Rajas is, distra is disturbed. Lucid would be like sattva. So you have five mind states and we just have three gunas. So okay. The mind states come from the Yoga Sutras, and the gunas come from the Bhagavad Gita. The koshas come from the Upanishads. <laughs> the doshas come from Ayurveda. So you could have put it all together. So this tamasic container, if it didn't have the pinpricks in it, the fire would transform the water into steam. That process of transformation is what I'm talking about when I say organized transformation. This is a, a household activity that happens in many households around the world on a daily basis. Water goes in the teapot. That's your clear intention. You put the teapot on the stove. That's clear action. You turn on the fire. There's the motivation. The fire transforms the water into steam. And the steam here represents the sattvic Sattva, excuse me, transformation like this. Now, I like to say, if 
you take yourself as your human container and you put yourself with the right intention and the right clear action in the right opportunity, you'll be helpless to become anything other than transformed. Should I say that again? Yes. If you take yourself as the human container that you are, that's your mind, your body, your spirit, your psyche, and you take this container with the right intention, by right we mean clear, this is as according to in Buddhism we say right action, right speech, right mindfulness, so with the right intention and the right action in the right opportunity, and you place yourself like that, you'll be helpless to experience anything other than transformation. Just like the water here is helpless to experience anything other than becoming steam. It's not going to become a giraffe. It's not going to become a fern. It's going to become steam. So you said the fire is action? The fire is motivation and action. Motivation. Yeah. The, the challenge that we face are those tiny pinpricks of thought, habituated thought. Countless habitual thoughts going on all day long. So we might have the right intention, we put the water in the teapot. We might have initial good action, we put the teapot on the stove. We might even turn the heat on. But then we forget to pay attention, the tiny pinpricks come along and they drain the water out of the teapot, dousing the fire and causing the teapot to burn to the stove. And instead of transformed into steam, you have a burned teapot <laughs> on the stove. I have done that once. I mean, an actual teapot burned to an actual stove. I, I moved from Brighton Bush Hot Springs where we had only gas heat to cook with, and I moved to a place with electrical heat. <laughs> and I thought the tea kettle was going to sing, but it didn't sing in this house. It never made a sound until the fire alarm was going off in the house, a smoke alarm, right? Because I burned the tea pot right to the electrical coil, that thing that goes like this. <laughs> then I had to take the coil and the teapot to the store to get them unhooked from each other. <gasps> was not possible. It was too burned on, so they got a new coil. But this is happening to people's lives, right? You walk away, you had your clear intention, you made some action in the right direction, you got set up, and then you forgot to pay attention. And the tiny pinpricks take over and the water gets drained again. And we long to experience that sattvic nature that is our clear heart, our lucid mind, our luminous presence. But there, there has to be steadiness in the action that we pursue, yes? So would one characterize the water as our total beingness? How would one characterize the water as our consciousness? Consciousness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So we're transforming into sattvic mind state, sattvic consciousness. Yeah. It's relatively simple, but not easy. Can you say that one more time? Right intention, right action. Right intention, right action, right opportunity. If you have the right action and the wrong opportunity, that's not so helpful. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, here we are in the classroom. The classroom is a container. It has four walls and some doors, and your intention and action got you here. Now, you might arrive in this classroom on another day and we're playing poker. It's highly unlikely that we're going to do that, but let's say that you came to play poker or to do some um, Facebooking. Well, that wouldn't be the right opportunity for awakening in. Generally speaking, people don't wake up from looking at Facebook. They don't wake up playing poker. They usually, we're waking up more with auspicious experiences. At times, out of pain and suffering, people do awaken, but it's to say the right opportunity is like, what, what are you doing with the circumstances, with your intention and your action? Is it the right opportunity? We can have right intention for motivation and clear action in a certain direction, and we're going the wrong way. Rajasic mind is doing that a lot. Rajasic mind has clear action in our culture, clear action towards money and possessions and accumulation. But it's not going in the direction of waking up. Because that's so habituated, it actually becomes more tamasic. So clear action, but falling down into the tamasic undertow of greed. Rajasic is greed, tamasic gets us stuck in greed. So here, in this, we have the four walls of the classroom, the container, the tamas. Most of us count on this floor being relatively stable for the rest of the night. It's not going to open up and have us fall into the volcanic activity beneath it. We also trust more or less the ceiling is going to stay where it is. This is a stable container. We have another container that's here, and that's each other, the sense of community. 
that's a really important container to have in your life. If you're looking to move more towards the sattvic life, less towards the unconscious or greedy life. We have a third thing that you're using right now, some of you more than others because your, your life routine. The third thing is your attention creates a container. What are you paying attention to? To what do you give your mind and your mental resources? And if it's daydreaming or fantasizing, that's not going to be so helpful. If it's planning or ruminating, it's also not as helpful. So we have those containers here in the room. Then you have this motivation, and we have shared motivation because we're here together in community. That's a very strong possibility then, that here we can experience what is sattvic. What kind of questions or comments do you have? Yes? I feel like this is like hitting home. Um, and one of the things that, and maybe this comes back to despondency, but one of the things that can feel so frustrating is, is maybe these, these glimpses of right intention, right action, but, but feeling um, routinely sabotaged. Like it doesn't feel like pinpricks, it, they feel like bullet holes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and in some ways this um, fatigue Mm -hmm. or, or sort of despair, like I feel like there's something different, but I can't get there. You know, I felt that you know, since I was two, or you mm -hmm. know, but never, never getting there, and and um, it just seems. I guess it seems kind of hopeless mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes. Yes. I should say in this particular moment in my life, it does feel like. Mm -hmm. oh, so hopeless and fatigue are both in the tamasic mind, like just falling into lethargy, mm -hmm. hopeless, fatigue, exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So I also associate tamas and rajas with faith and courage. Can I talk about that for a few minutes here? And would you be willing to turn the AC back on? It's kind of stuffy for me in here. Are you guys too warm? warm. I'm afraid you're going to fall asleep. Huh? Would a window work better? You can do that too. Yeah, if somebody's willing to open the, the window a crack, that would be helpful. Hmm. It's great to have all your body heat in the room. I love that, that you're here. And it can make people feel sleepy. So, so if we look at, I'm going to just take the bottom of this board here so I can respond to what Rosie was saying. This is Raja's here. Let's look back at the switchbacks I was talking about before when you get on a mountain and you're taking the same switchback again and again. This is from earlier today. When those switchbacks are occurring like this, the switchback gets deeper and deeper and deeper. It becomes a, a significant groove in your path on the mountain. Well, one of the ways to lose faith in yourself is to keep running the same grooves again and again. So it's hard to come over to this side of the groove and then back to this side repeatedly and trust that you're going to do something different. Mm -hmm. So we lose faith in our ability to make change because we're reinforcing that we're not when we're stuck on those switchbacks. And yet, we might do it just enough in each direction that we could fool ourselves for a few years. <laughs> How many years has it been? <laughs> she says, rolling her eyes, 10. 10 years. That's actually not too bad. <laughs> 10 years is relatively short. For some humans, it's 20 or 30 years that we're going back and forth between these options. And, and the, <coughs> the next gain of elevation on the mountain seems so elusive. You might even see people hiking up there, but you're not sure how they got there. So what happens here is you lose faith in yourself as someone who could create change. To come back to that faith, what we need, the benefit of tamas here, I'm going to put this in terms of tamas. So here's tamas, which is also like having faith. And by faith in this case, I mean faith in yourself as a person who's trustworthy, who's dependable, faith in yourself as someone that you can count on. So we start creating accountability with ourselves. To create situations in your life where you're accountable with yourself, 
is to create a stronger container. Your teapot will be more stable. So how might you create more accountability with yourself? Community. Community. Yeah, <coughs> because if you have the right community, I'm saying right again like in the Buddhist sense, not like a, a American where we say right or wrong, but we have right community means we have a shared community in a similar direction and they're willing to be honest with you. So you have to be more honest with yourself in certain friendships because they're going to be honest with you in return. So that accountability through community is one really strong way to come into more faith or tamas, more stability with yourself. Yes? Yes. Vrata means a personally chosen sadhana practice. So if you say what you're going to do and then you do it, you become more trustworthy with yourself. You're more accountable to yourself. If you say, I'm going to get up in the morning at 6 a.m. to have yoga practice, and then 6 a.m. comes around and you hit snooze, and you don't get up, one day you say, oh, that's okay, I was tired. If you do it the next day, you say, well, I kind of had bad digestion, so I need to keep sleeping. And the next day you say, well, I don't have to be anywhere till 1 o'clock, so I'll get up at 8 and then do my yoga. And the next day you push it and they say, well, I kind of did a lot of yoga yesterday, and today I just need a few minutes of yoga, so I'm going to wait until 9 o'clock to do my yoga. Well, you become an untrustworthy person from you to you. The accountability starts to fade. Because you said you would do one thing, but you haven't been doing it. So not just with your community, but with yourself. Essentially, accountability is to say, I do what I'm going to say I do. And therefore, I have to be careful what I'm going to say to myself. I should say things that I can commit to. In some ways, those switchbacks I was drawing before are created out of misperception and inappropriate expectations. I misperceive myself, then I set up expectations I can't follow through on. Often when your life gets out of balance just enough in one direction, you make a decision that you know is going to pull it back towards balance, but you made a decision from way down here that you're going to do this thing that actually needs incremental steps to get to. So we make a decision we, we can't live up to, and then we lose <coughs> faith in ourselves again. So rather than one big decision, you can make incremental decisions where you demonstrate to yourself that you matter and that you're accountable and trustworthy, and you can have faith in yourself in the process. Does that make some sense? Yes? Mm -hmm. and, I would, and I think <coughs> that this is the only way that it works. Because we see in our society that <coughs> a lot of the ways that we hold people accountable, once mm -hmm. you remove this, and you see even in children, if it's the spanking and those kinds of things, then the minute you leave the room, the behavior returns, mm -hmm. rather than teaching accountability inside, so that it just doesn't happen. I mean, it's really the only way for it to stay. Yes. Because otherwise, every time that goes away for a second, the behavior returns again. Right. And if accountability gets translated as punishment when there's not accountability, who wants it? Mm -hmm. So this accountability I'm talking about is accountability with yourself or with your community where you're able to be in integrity with your actions. You're able to be in honest relationship with yourself and with others. And there's not a punishment when you make a mistake because the mistake has its own reverberations. That's painful enough. We don't need to, on top of that, recriminate people for falling short of their own commitments. I think falling short in your commitment is actually painful enough if you're looking at it. Not just in the long term, but in the short term, too. Yes? Why do you think that it is that we have a harder time being accountable with ourselves in the relationship with ourselves versus the relationship with other people? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? Well, I guess you can't, you can feel the feeling of, you know, maybe being sad with yourself because you didn't follow through with something that you hoped that you could have. But when you do that with someone else, maybe you see the face of that person uh, mm -hmm. feeling sad or have the discussion about it. And you can see it in front of you versus just it's more disguised in you. Like you can feel mm -hmm. it, but you can't Yes. I think there's a couple, that's really, really um, accurate, yes, I agree with you. And I think there's two other things to consider, and I'll, I'll mention them here, and you can tell me what you think. Okay. One is that because we're social creatures, we're born with social brains, this is not 
just a metaphor, it's real, <laughs> just a brain science. So we're social brains, social creatures, and we rely on each other, therefore, for our survival and for thriving. We're in the, in the mammal community, so mammals have social brains. We need each other in order to stay alive and to stay well. So if I'm going to disappoint somebody else by not being accountable to them, the primitive part of me that needs them for my survival might feel anxious enough that I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to be out of integrity with them or out of accountability with them because they might reject, abandon, or disregard me. And that's very painful, but frightens the most primitive part of our survival instinct. That's one consideration. The other is I negotiate with myself secretly to let myself off the hook really often. Like, oh, it's okay. No, I'll make up for it later. So the negotiation is like, I said that I would do that, but I didn't do it, so I'll do it later. So right now I'm going to do this other thing that feels like better and more nurturing, which is like sleep or TV or not showing up for my athletic endeavor or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I'm negotiating inside, but the negotiations are really about my comfort zone, not about my courage, not about the courage to do something different or new or to grow. It's about keeping myself comfortable. So those negotiations, sometimes people call that being gentle with themselves. I think we could be a lot more gentle with ourselves as people, but I translate that as tenderness, kindness, compassion, empathy, not as let yourself off the hook more often, which is how I hear the phrase used frequently. I'm going to be gentle with myself. I'm not going to hold myself up to my standards right now. So I'll come back to you in just a moment and hear what you think about what I said. Yes. So what would, um, this is different than my personal Vata practice, but I've been meditating like 10 to 15 minutes every morning as soon as I wake up Great. for almost two years now. Mm -hmm. And I found that recently, and it's astounding how much just 10 minutes will help mm -hmm. for a whole day. Yes. Um, and so that's really kept me dedicated. Part of why I think it helps you, Leticia, is that you're being faithful. Yeah. You're being faithful to something really important. You're on your own radar screen. You matter. And you do it first thing in the day, it makes a healthy foundation, a healthy, stable container. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've noticed lately, though, that I have been negotiating a little bit, but I'm not sure how I feel about it and if it falls into what the pattern that you're talking about. Because I've noticed that my husband and I, both of us are very busy. And I've noticed that since I've been doing this, we've had an intimacy when I wake up where I just kind of want to lay in bed for mm -hmm. 10 minutes and be with him. And it seems like something so simple, but that's actually a new kind of thing for us. And we start out the day just being with one another, even if it's five or 10 minutes in bed, holding hands or playing or shaking each other or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And it's almost like I feel like something new has come out of that. So I'm not quite sure if the negotiation is a bad thing or if it mm -hmm. inspired and led to something different. So I guess I'm, there's a confusion there about whether I'm negotiating and that should be something that I should pull away from or if it's just that's part of the transformation is accepting that it's going to change. And there's Does it have to be now. either the yeah. husband or the meditation? No, sometimes it's that because I told myself that I would do it as soon as I got up out of bed. Well, first I walk my dog because he'll pee inside if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and I, I would do it right away as soon as I came in after taking my dog. And now I kind of just want to play with my husband and just like hold. I mean, I, I do. I say play, but I really do mean that. Like I'll jump in the bed and start jumping and shake him and um, for like 10 minutes and then I'll meditate. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not... I guess I'm kind of struggling with that, wanting to have faith and accountability and keep that practice going, and at the same time knowing that things change in life, and mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if something... Yeah, so tamasic, when something has healthy tamas, it means healthy constancy, like consistency, like I was saying before, accountability. So generally speaking, through the yoga lens, it's recommended that when you choose a time for meditation, it's consistent. So if you were able to get up a little earlier and have this other play period and then know that when you sit down, that's the, it's a regular time of day, it's a consistency that you are instilling. You can trust yourself to be there on your meditation cushion at that time of day. And that, that's the thing that's unchanging, that's stable. 
So this, I'm speaking through the lens of yoga when I say that. So I don't mean to be too harsh about it, but if we're looking at yoga's potential for transformation, there are certain sort of regulations recommended, and one of those is the consistency with when you sit and when you practice and how you practice. So if I was your yoga teacher, let's say you're a, a swami or a swamiji, I would say sit at the same time every day and have the play time either before or after that, but don't displace it. Keep it with you. And when you need to, ch if that needs to change for whatever reason, is that a clear intention that you set for yourself that if it needs to change, to I would recommend, so in terms of tamas, healthy container may be community, accountability with yourself, but it's also having a healthy relationship with a teacher or a guide, somebody you can go to and say, I'm considering changing this really important thing. What do you think about that? Somebody who knows you well enough and who also knows the practice or teachings of yoga and is not just talking about asana with you, but that you can consult with somebody about the change you're about to make. Because often what can happen is you're growing and changing and evolving and we just get a little bit uncomfortable and we change our decision. We go back to where we've been and you might look back five years from now and say, oh, that was my switchback. That's how I went backwards. So if you have somebody actually watching you and says, you know what, you've really been evolving. You have more equanimity, you're more lucid, you're more self-aware, don't give up now. Keep going, keep going. Because this part of the change cycle right here where my finger is, is very well worn by humans. Little change, little backslide. Little change, little backslide. Little change, little backslide. So you might be having a long switchback right now, but I wouldn't want to encourage you to take that switchback down. So do you understand what I'm saying there? <laughs> and Laura, did you have any reflection off of what I said before? Um, yeah, and I think also what you were talking about too. Um, so I thought it was interesting when you were talking about us as social beings and how that's such a crucial part to us is these connections we have with other people. Um, and then, but also it's so crucial, like us too, you know, just you yourself. You need yourself so much in order to. Mm -hmm be anything on this earth. So to not have that working well, I guess you can still survive, but it's not pleasant. So no. But I guess, yeah, I don't know. Do we just, are we so used to not feeling so great and just carrying that and so we keep moving and that's less important to ourselves in a way than relationships with other people? Or, I don't, because they seem equally important, but mm -hmm. for some reason this one's like... When not. people acclimate, so I had the pendulum up here before, mm -hmm. let's say people acclimate to certain states of dullness, but that becomes comfortable and familiar to them. Somebody else might acclimate to certain states of anxiety or chaos. Mm -hmm. It's actually comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. Somebody else might acclimate to a certain kind of rigidity or like um, uptightness, and that's comfortable for them may not be your comfort zone, but it's become comfortable for them because they acclimated to it. Often that acclimation is a strategy out of our earliest life conditioning. We started using it when our brains were very flexible, very malleable, very conditionable. So if we made our style and it helped us for a certain time, it may be hard to outgrow that style. So then we have our relationship with ourselves, which was conditioned by these other relationships. Now we have our new community called our friends and adult companions, different than your birth family, for example. So now how I choose my friends is often based on my conditioning. So one of the challenges we face on the spiritual journey is that you may start outgrowing the kinds of friends that you've had. You may start outgrowing the companions that you've had. Sometimes people come to me and say that their friends still want to go out late at night or drink alcohol a lot or spend time eating late at night and they're trying to get up in the early morning for their yoga practice. Those two things are opposed to each other. I say, what should I do? I say, you should do the yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I'm a yoga teacher, I also say, of course, but more because I'm a yoga student. I say, we should do the yoga because something is calling to you in the practices and the routines of your daily life to bring you back to faith and accountability with yourself and then to provide you with the next stage, which is called courage. I'll put it up here in just a moment. So we can outgrow behaviors. We can outgrow thoughts and patterns. We might outgrow people. 
We may grow back in a relationship with them at another time. We don't have to exile them from our life, but sometimes the behaviors of others are not harmonious with our clear intentions, our clear actions, and they help us to miss an opportunity, not to take an opportunity. Do you understand what I mean by that? So here on this side we have rajas, and I'm saying on this side because I'm using the board, not because it's actually uh, opposed like this. Rajas is also your courage. Courage means you have the courage to withstand the discomfort of change or transformation. For in fact, it will be kind of uncomfortable. We all sort of long for it, like, I'd long to be a better person. Well, looking forward to it. Hopefully that will come to me someday. <laughs> but in the longing for it, you may not realize the discomforts that you have to tolerate. Like, I was just working with a client yesterday, and she's practicing in her car when she's commuting between southwest Portland and um, Vancouver. She's practicing in her car, not getting annoyed at the other drivers. What's that? That'd be messed up. <laughs> This is a pretty high practice, so she's, she's practicing not being annoyed with the other drivers. Well, being annoyed, turns out, was a good outlet for her sometimes, or felt like a, you know, a nice outlet. It's not really a good outlet. So I, I gave her a practice to do on um, compassion for the other drivers. It's been, it's been a huge relief, very demanding, and very uncomfortable. So she's being really honest about the research she's put, she's put into it, about her personal research. Huge relief. I don't have to be angry anymore. Very challenging. But I am angry at that person. They just cut me off in traffic. Very uncomfortable. Oh, I'm not supposed to stay angry at that person. In fact, it's not helping me. It's not helping them. But what am I going to do instead? Anger was familiar and compassion wasn't familiar. So we need courage to take the steps on the journey towards this possibility of a more sattvic life. And courage also provides our motivation. And to stay motivated is to outlive that little slip I was saying, behavior change has a well-worn groove right here where we're growing, whoops, we slipped back. We're growing up, we slipped back. Growing, slipped back. So we need courage and motivation to go up over that little curve in the behavior change cycle. So in this model of the teapot, being more accountable to yourself is the first step. For if the teapot's not working, too many holes, if the teapot has no water in it, if the teapot is not on the stove, if it's sitting out back on the patio, it's not going to be that helpful to you. So we start here with <coughs> resurrecting your faith in yourself and becoming more accountable to you. Also to your yoga, if that's the path that you've chosen, or you could say to your dharma. Then we add some courage and motivation when the going gets tough on this. Here's the cool thing about it. I'm going to put this up in a, a different human systems model right now. Does it seem daunting to you guys? No. Okay. That does what seem daunting? What's that? Does what seem daunting? Changing our lives? The process of transforming your life, does that seem daunting? Yeah. Depends on the degree. Yeah. yeah. So let's say here we are with Thomas. This is a ladder. Now I'm going to talk specifically about mind states because, in fact, yoga would suggest that we pursue the sattvic mind state. Let me make a little detour. Tamasic times of day are the times of day in which you feel more slow, more inward. Sattvic <coughs> times of day are where you feel lucid and you have the inclination to meditate. And it, it's actually recommended you meditate during the sattvic periods of the day. Sunrise and sunset are sattvic periods in the day. Rajasic periods of the day are when we have intense busyness. And my teacher recommends lessening the rajas in your life, lessening the unhealthy tamas in your life, and promoting the sattvic, what is that which is sattvic. So it means like certain foods are tamasic. Like if you eat enough salt, <laughs> if you eat enough potato chips, that's tamasic. If you drink enough caffeine, that's rajasic. So you're looking at the times of day and the foods that you eat the activities we have, some are tamasic, some are rajasic, some are sattvic. A tamasic activity might be too many episodes of Netflix in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I love Netflix. What's that? 
I have teenage stepson, so I've seen this. <laughs> if you look at what, what Netflix says I'm watching, it's not me. That is not me. Do not look at my account. It says I'm watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not watching. No. I'm also watching like mm, sci-fi movies with a lot of violence and some other thing. Oh, and those mystery things where somebody gets killed horribly. Um, so too much of that <laughs> is very Tomasic. Right? Because your mind gets more dull and the body gets dull sitting there in front of the, the Netflix. Rajasic activity could be like too much driving around the city, going all these different errands, running about, running here, running there, all the busyness that is physical body busyness and mental body busyness. That's rajasic activity. Sattvic activity is like meditation, walking in nature, observing the natural world, remembering that you're a part of it, singing, and singing sattvically, not singing like you ran over the dog and the boyfriend <laughs> died and the world's falling apart and not singing like a country and western country song. Western. Yeah. <laughs> That's not sattvic. No. Nor is the like the um, really important political statements, however, rap music and so on, that's rajasic. So what you listen to by way of music, what you sing by way of music, it can be tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic. What you eat, the activities, and so on. This goes so far into yogic philosophy, I don't have time for it, but it can even go into what colors are you wearing. Some are sattvic, some are rajasic, some are tamasic. Sattvic colors considered white, for example. White and light colors, this is sattvic. So a yogi bhajan, they're wearing white outfits, not black outfits. And it goes beyond that into which animals are sattvic and tamasic and rajasic and where you should spend time and so on. In fact, dogs are considered rajasic. Not, not in this country in the same way as in India. Dogs run wild in India and they have diseases and they are, you can see it, the temperament is a lot more sketchy, scared, um, ambivalent, moving about, un, unpredictable. So that's a rajasic animal in India. Here, the common house pet known as the dog, particularly the one here at the yoga studio, he's pretty tamasic <laughs> because he has, has bad legs, he doesn't move well enough. So different temperaments, different animals, different colors, different seasons, different foods, and so on. But in this model, we're going to talk about the nature of the mind. Yes? I know you said in the beginning you shouldn't mix these up, but it sounds a lot like... The doshas. <laughs> it's easy to see how people can play the two. Yeah. yeah. Think about the mental effect, like what mind state you're having here. But if we say these are like the doshas, then we're going to say kapha is bad, pitta is mm, draining, and vata is the best. But it's not true. The doshas are the doshas, they're all neutral. When your dosha goes out of balance, that's not great for you. These are also relatively neutral. They're just they're states of energy in nature. So if you look at the impact on your mind and you ask, am I having a tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic mind? This is the consideration. If I eat this food, how does my mind feel? Dull? If I drink that beverage, do I feel racy in my mind? If I, if I drink this other thing, do I feel sattvic and clear and balanced? What is the impact on my mind? If I hang out with this friend, do I feel dull? If I hang out with that friend, do I feel anxious? If I'm with this person, do I feel like really relaxed and a much more gratitude? That's a more sattvic mind state. Yeah. Would you just say again, the, you said sattvic is more morning, like sunrise, sunrise and, and sunset. sunset for meditation, and then I sort of missed uh, rajasic. Rajasic is when the period of the day is the busiest, usually it's the hottest. Like, yeah. I mean, you can feel like the pavement is really hot, the sun is hot, you're getting annoyed. For me, that rajasic period of the day as a bike commuter is the bike ride home. Because I'm riding uphill only in one direction, only on the way home. Uphill in the sun, in rush hour traffic, and the pavement's been getting heated all day. And the temperament of the drivers is rajasic. And because there's some stop and go, the Barber Boulevard has a lot of fumes. That's a rajasic experience for me to ride my bike home for that. Fortunately, I have a backyard garden that's very sattvic. I don't walk into a rajasic messy house. I walk into a, a, a place that's clean and warm and nurturing. I don't walk into a, a home where you can see all the untended to projects, a tamasic house. I, it's, ju it's just 
nurturing when I arrive there. And I'm aware that this is a rajasic bike ride home. And that when I get there, if I'm not careful, my rajasic nature could take over. Yes? So just to clarify, is that, so it's less a specific time of day, though the rajasic period would be more during the daytime activity, but it sounds like it's more the kind of combined elements that create the experience? It's the peak time of activity in the day in our human animal kingdom. Those are things like rush hour. Okay. And, and because we have an attitude about rush hour, and it's called rush hour, um, <laughs> that's more rajasic. Nighttime, the really dark middle of the night, that's more tamasic. Sunrise, sunset, those are auspicious times of day for spiritual practice. And if you really feel the energy, just, I mean, try lying in bed for six weeks, because I, I had to, I ran the experiment. You can really feel. There it is. Oh, this is the rajasic time of day. Oh. This is the tamasic time of night. Oh, this is the time to meditate. You just sit back and really watch the natural world. It's evidenced. It's there. Yes? Well, I sort of am a little confused because when I think of <coughs> organized transformation, I think about wanting to get to a place, this lucid, beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Yes. I thought I was going to walk out of here with night. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see to it. <laughs> but when I'm listening to you sort of explain the different the different mind states or the different um, gunas, they, they all are serving. They, yep. So, so so I don't necessarily want to transform to this lucid place. It wouldn't serve me in the nature of of my life to just always be there. I mean, it'd be beautiful, but... It would serve you to live with a sattvic mind, but not with a dissociated body. It would serve you to live with a sattvic mind, but not a cold detachment towards other humans on the planet. Right, so... What am I, what are, what, what am I transforming towards? You well, know, I'm going like to give you that... I'll give you that picture here now. Yeah, because it's <laughs> yeah. like... A, yeah. Yeah. Please do. And then would, you, would you, Lynn, would you get me a small Swiss ball to sit on so I can sit and write on here? No, Thank Swiss ball. The Which round so ones back there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here, this is one model to look at this process for transformation. And this is why I'm going to put it as the ladder model because transformation does have a process similar to developmental stages. You've all been through some developmental stages in your life already. You broke your teeth, right? They came in through the gums. You lost those teeth, you got new teeth. <coughs> you learned to walk and to talk. You learned that there's a self and other. You've been through some developmental processes in life already. So this is a developmental model that I'm going to put up here. And the cool thing is you can keep recreating this. You can keep reusing it. So the tamasic at the bottom here, this is your stable foundation, like I was saying before. It's how you create faith in yourself. It's where you're accountable. And what I think is so fascinating about this is if you simply choose how to create that container, that stability, and you say yes to it every day, you will automatically put yourself in the fire that becomes rajas. You have to be unwavering with the commitment that you're making. Therefore, make healthy commitments. So if I make commitments like I'm going to hydrate or meditate or get good sleep, let's make them reasonable commitments towards our vitality and our health. If I say, rather, I'm going to read five books a day and run 20 miles every day, that's how I'm going to demonstrate my accountability to myself. Those aren't wise decisions to make. So the decisions you make here and the practice to stick with these creates the fortitude and the energy, the motivation to keep moving up. So this container, the stronger it gets, the more it's going to push your energy this way, up. The more clear, the more consistent, the more aligned this is with your actual vitality, with your body's intelligence, the more likely you are to rise into rajas where you experience courage and motivation. And the fire of this in the Yoga Sutras is called tapas, T-A-P-A-S. Tapas means discipline, which you're experiencing here. 
It also means heat, purification, and transformation. So that is to say, if I make this commitment to my rata, you guys were talking about this in the last module, if I make a commitment to this thing here, and I keep my commitment, I'm going to cause myself to experience the fire, the friction between my commitment and my resistance to my commitment. And as I put those two things together, my commitment and my resistance, and they go like this, the two things rubbing against each other will cause enough fire that transformation will eventually happen, like the tea kettle on the stove. But if I make a commitment and I keep forgetting it, if I keep negotiating it, if I keep denying it, if I keep changing it, if I keep moving it up to be in my comfort zone, if I keep uh, forgetting it in place of something else, I won't experience the fire that causes rajas. We need rajas to go vertically, but most of us it's going horizontally. So we start climbing up here into this rajas and we get just uncomfortable enough that we take a turn like this. Oop, that was enough. Then we say, oop. We go back down to the familiar. This is what the behavior change chart looks like for most people. So you come up, you have some energy, some change, some transformation, some new possibilities. The going gets tough, the fire gets hotter. We say, this is pretty uncomfortable. We don't, may say unconsciously, not consciously. And we, get, we take a left turn, we go down, we get disappointed, we feel lethargic again. We say, I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to make some new commitments. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, just Rose, stop just talking. talking. <laughs> <laughs> Am I talking Sorry, about you? Famous. Yeah, no. No, like everything. I'm like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> it's just uncanny. Come on, I'm talking about the human condition here. I'm not just talking about Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the human. Yeah. But the, the beautiful thing is, really, if you were able to uh, divert the urge for the escape hatch and go vertically, rajas is meant to take us vertically. A bird takes flight like this, fire <coughs> rises like this. The, that vertical ascent of the geyser at, Yos at uh, Yellowstone, our vertical ascent of the mountain, we're actually intending to go up. So you need enough rajas, enough courage to tolerate that. This will cause discomfort. Mm -hmm. If you had enough stable foundation, you will trust yourself to navigate the discomfort. If I had another grease board sitting next to this one, I would put down here, stable early family life with healthy, secure attachment. <laughs> I put some other things on the next developmental phases, but if we didn't have great stability in early life, if we didn't get attuned mirroring in early life, so we have a sense like, we're a person who's resilient, and we have capacity and permission. If we missed out on that developmental phase, we have to recreate it now with ourselves, with our new community. And you do that with this, the commitments you make in the tamasic sense, in the, how you make your container. One thing that I think um, helps me in thinking about all this is to remember the purpose of this is loving myself and loving others. I mean, it's not just rigidly no. doing these things, so I'm going to evolve, um, but that, you know, just when you were having us breathe, um, and you were having us during the yoga, during the asana, yes. and that was really cool, by the way, to mm -hmm. do that the whole time, mm -hmm. pay attention to the ujjayi. Yes. But I was thinking, okay, I'm doing this because not because it's good for me, but because it brings me back to myself. Mm -hmm. Right, so here in the tamasic container that you're creating, the commitments that I mentioned earlier are ways to say to yourself, I matter. My vitality matters. My awakening matters. My health matters. And these are commitments, fundamental commitments like hydration and rest. But also the commitments to limit the pinpricks that your mind creates. The pinpricks that are like self-doubt and self-criticism and vacillation and uh, apathy, resignation, those kinds of pinpricks in the mind. If you have to practice starting somewhere, however, most of us do have to start somewhere, the 
things to choose for your commitments for accountability. I recommend that they have some physicality to them because it's a representation. Thank you, Dom, for drinking some water right there. This is a representation of intention, clear action, clear opportunity. The water's in the cup. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> that, that that can happen and you see it physically represented. The, the part of your brain and therefore also your mind that needs to trust you again sees it occurring. And you start building the neural networks and also the mind patterns that are more likely to grow vertically rather than getting dissipated horizontally and then falling back down to the subconscious repository and then think, I gotta get out of this mess, but then you recreate the mess and you fall back down like this. Once you've sort of integrated or understood how to do it with hydration or rest, you can start tackling the mind habits. Sarah Joy. So I, I um, find it interesting because I think <clears throat> often when I've read a lot of things like in the realm of hungry ghosts and things where it's really attached to trauma when people mm -hmm. struggle to be more with this and even end up in addiction and some other yeah. things, which I believe in obviously that, you know, the more of that. But then I sit with a lot of people who have been through some tough stuff and it really shocked me. I was in a group the other day and probably half of them said, you know, I knew I was really loved and adored when I was younger. I still did this thing. Mm -hmm. So then you think, okay, wait a minute. You know, and then there's others that go through really hard things and seem to fare well. So the personality must really get in here as well. Well, we're all born with a certain genetic um, tone for our resilience, including yeah. our vagal tone. Yeah. You're born with that and it can be shaped by experience. Yeah. So someone might be born with high resilience, know that they're in a loving family, but then they might sort of teeter or totter when they go out into the world and they don't have the same sense of attunement or connection and their high resilience might start getting broken down. Mm -hmm. And conditioning is very powerful in our culture. Yes, it's yes. everywhere in the media. Someone else can have a really traumatic, unfortunate childhood meet the right medical, psychotherapeutic, community care providers and thrive from that. We are, we are malleable in that way, mm -hmm. which is also why when Jeanette said earlier, community, we need each other for this stable tamas, yeah. the stable sense of community. Mm -hmm. So when you're growing here and you're moving in this direction and the rajas can take you vertically, I think here, this is where Lisa was asking, what am I gonna evolve towards? What am I transforming towards? So I've made my commitments, I'm taking my action, I'm tolerating the discomfort that I'm actually growing and changing and becoming more vital, and I'm nudging my mind up into sattvic territory. It means when you get here in the rajas, the temptations are greed and ego. So here you are, you've made your commitments, you're getting better, you're really hydrated, you sleep really well, you eat the proper foods, you've got the great yoga poses, you've got the cool yoga outfits, <laughs> You've got the Sanskrit language mastered, you're doing it, but right here the temptation is greed and ego, meaning it's reinforcing your sense of self. Like, I'm doing it, is a misunderstanding. Down here in Tamas, like in early life, when we want to develop a healthy sense of self for a child, we want to say, yeah, you're doing it. In Tamas, I want to say, yeah, I trust myself. When I get to Rajas, I have to start realizing that there are larger forces in consciousness that are helping me to awaken. And it isn't about it turning out how I want it to turn out. That's where greed and ego and anger will end up showing their faces. So here, rather, we start realizing this is a much bigger force than I am, this thing called consciousness or love or <coughs> compassion. And I'm growing towards that. This requires, sattva requires an element of surrender. Surrendering your grip on who you think you have to be. Also surrendering your notion of who you have to become. It will have a larger force than you at this part of the journey. Um, yes? When the model with Thomas as faith and Rajas as courage, is there a corresponding notion for Sattva? Surrender. Love. As Ananda, you remember Ananda Mayakosha, love as Ananda. Now the good news is that once you start with the tamasic stabilizing of your life, and I mean stabilizing it in the healthy sense, you have a good sleep routine, a good hydration routine, and so on. I don't mean tamasic like dull. 
Once you start this process, you will have glimpses of the sattvic nature that's already you. Those glimpses are magnetically pulling you towards this. You don't have to just like suffer for a long time and then go to heaven. I'm sorry. If I just spoke over somebody's religion, I didn't mean it that way. Did I fed anybody? For <laughs> <laughs> well, the, this is the thing that I, the family that I was raised in was agnostic, but the families that my parents were raised in were very religious. And the, the overtone that came down to me was, you suffer your whole life and work hard, and then you get to go to heaven. So, pardon me, that's not the yogic model. What's happening here is your tamas is affording you the stability with which to glimpse that thing called sattva. And Rajas gives you other glimpses of it. You've already experienced it, or you wouldn't be haunted enough by yoga to keep coming back. <laughs> but to be willing to live up here in the sattvic mind with enough embodiment, tamas, and enough courage to have this balance out in your life takes stewardship. Because the temptations are strong for lethargy and apathy, for greed and ego, the temptations are very strong. We have to steward the process. And once you start cultivating that, as I said earlier today with Lynn, there's a kind of, you climb up above tree line at a certain point, you're on the mountain, and you start seeing that these ancient teachings make sense. And that traditions from different pl places on the planet are coming together actually saying the same thing. You start realizing it, and it's realizing you. But when you're below tree line, that's like here. Where you keep falling back down from rajas to tamas, from rajas to tamas. You're, you're still in the trees of greed and ego, lethargy and apathy. This should be good news. Are you feeling like it's good news? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I know this sounds like so simplistic. In fact, I say it in my, in my book. Um, that once you start picking up any one practice to nurture yourself, right, which is here in Tamas, any one practice to nurture yourself, once you take that on, that one thing will transform your life because it will transform your relationship to discipline, to faith and courage and love. <coughs> to sip your water is basically to say, I matter. To say, here's a gesture of love. Yes? So I just love that because really like if you you're what you're saying it really is like if you have a stability or if you you make an action or have an intention and there's some heat and pressure or action then you will get something no matter what there will always be some kind of change or something something will develop out of it so having that faith is so is so important mm -hmm. and i see this every day with people that i work with and it's so it's vital and it's so important mm -hmm. as they move up so when you're, and the work that she's doing is with people who do have trauma histories, is that right? Mm -hmm. They have PTSD and some traumatic brain injuries also? Yeah, and right now I work with homeless. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they all have tons of trauma. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, the community of Tomas, the community that surrounds them becomes really important here, but that community has to also be really wise here in the Rajas, in the part of their life. It changes. I think they, their community down here at Thomas has to potentially change when they go up to Thomas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you as providers have different responsibilities in the Tomasic phase compared to the Rajasic phase. Right. As a provider here, we have to offer from our own life experiences how to do loving discipline with ourselves. I'm not saying you have to provide punishment by no means, but we provide this like, here's the container, here's the container, I'm consistent, I'm consistent. I'm available to you. I'm going to keep seeing you as a person with potential and capacity. I'm going to keep seeing that same thing again. I'm super consistent in how I see and care for you. Right. And I role model that to you. And you become more trusting of me and then more stabilized in our relationship. And then they can move up. And as they come up here, the rajas is more like, OK, now I'm your cheerleader. I see your strength. I see your fortitude. I'm not going to hold you to this stage because you're, you're not a child, you've outgrown the child stage, or you've outgrown the tamas stage. I'm going to help you here at this rajasic stage. Like, okay, what can we put into action? Where are you motivated? How can I help you decide if those are good directions to go? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put energy in this with you. But if I put energy in too soon, I might cause the system to feel chaotic. Yes. And if I let go too soon of the stability, I might lose somebody to fall back to their less mature state. And as I start to come up here, 
if I, if I feel threatened by their sattvic realizations, I feel like, no, wait, you need me as a provider. <laughs> then I'm going to do them a really big disservice. Mm-hmm. And so we are, we're helping people to outgrow us. Essentially, my teacher, Catherine, who some of you met, she says, you're doing a good job if people outgrow you. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Amen. We should outgrow the need <laughs> for, for this, and then we can be of service to others. Yes? That just, I don't think that's what you said, but I just want to make sure. Um, I just heard that we outgrow those, um, like being accountable to ourselves. No, no. What I'm saying is as a provider, so she's working with people, I'm talking about in the provider relationship, that as a provider for someone in the tamasic phase of their development, I have to be super consistent. As a provider here, I get to match with their energy and enthusiasm and courage. They can even borrow it from me. But if I get here to the courage and enthusiasm, and they're there also, and then I start to feel uncomfortable and I say, oh, let's pull you back down here, mm-hmm. I might infantilize them mm-hmm. rather than help up-level them. But in terms of going through these tra- um, stages, mm-hmm. we always keep the Thomas and the Rajas yes. with us, right? They're going with us. Yeah. yeah, like, why would you stop hydrating yourself just because you fell in love? Yeah. Why do people do that? <laughs> because falling in love repeat, has these three components. Amnesia, it's like taking an amnesiac, a painkiller, and an upper. I don't need to hydrate. Everything's fine. And I don't remember ever being in pain before either. So in fact, I can eat whatever I want to because I'm up all night falling in love. So no, we don't. You take these things with you, Lynn. They keep going. OK. Yes. <laughs> we were talking earlier about the relationship with a, with a teacher and mm-hmm. what does that mean, the student-teacher relationship. And I was thinking about how I always hate the word teacher and I don't like it when someone has to ha- like tries to have a teacher-student relationship with me. But rather, the people who have really influenced me are people who help me to find my own mm-hmm. inner teacher. And I'm okay with that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and just... And a, a couple of things. How last module we were talking about things that we kept hidden mm-hmm. and we never wanted people to see. And one of your former trainees said her capacity to move. Mm-hmm. And that really okay. touched me because I felt that as well, like very deeply when she mm-hmm. had said that. And I think about um, like the care providers that I work with, there was, there was a shift that happened where it was like I... I needed to verbally process to, I just need to move, and I need someone here to witness me and watch and just mm-hmm. witness and validate. Yes. And I need nothing more than that. Mm-hmm. If it's totally silent the whole time and someone's just watching, I'm good. Mm-hmm. Like, there's something about that that's really powerful to me. So would that be like the, the Thomas? Mm-hmm. Okay. The person who's able to, with stability, witness and hold space for, that's making a container for Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, as a person, as a uh, care provider, as we are as teachers <coughs> and mentors, when a person in our company starts to grow into the rajasic phase, and you might sense them taking a left turn and going then south, mm-hmm. here we may need to be a little bit more obvious about the courage required. And sometimes that means leaning towards the person to help them borrow your courage. Tamara? You know, and this is absolutely no disrespect intended in the room, but I see this sometimes um, a problem in our culture that relies heavily on counseling. And um, I've used counseling in my life, and it's been fabulous in groups for sure. But I believe in this to use it to move beyond it. Mm -hmm. And I think we live in a culture that first of all, labels every type of behavior they can label. Mm -hmm. Now there's, what do they call them, spectrum. Everything's on a spectrum, Mm -hmm. which encompasses all of us. Um, And also, people go to counseling, and then that's all that happens. Or sort of like, I guess you could go to church on Sunday and do whatever else you Mm -hmm. want, go to yoga class on Friday and do whatever else you want, and now going to counseling with no end in sight. And sort of... Unfortunately, sometimes you wonder if that isn't the nature of the beast because if the student moves on, then mm-hmm. the counselor doesn't have the student anymore either. So um, I, it was just a thought process when I was thinking about that, that we, 
that I know in Buddhism they say Buddhist, Buddhism is the match and it should burn itself up mm -hmm. and it's just to get you there. So I'm just thinking about that when you said that as something I see people sort of get trapped in and they're just forever in counseling and nothing's mm -hmm. ever changing. You know? mm -hmm. that, that's a, that's, I, I just need to say, just because I, I don't know who's in this room or what kind of situation they're in, but I would just like to say that that, that can also be an internalized um, discussion that a person has with himself to sabotage something that's really good because counseling sometimes saves people's lives and to have the expectation that it's going to be over at a certain time can be harmful. No, so and I think you're not, saying two different I, I things said there. I no disrespect oh, intended when I started because I personally used <coughs> counseling in groups and everything to survive. What I'm saying is when it's not doing anything in the life except to go and sort of stir up the A little bit like self-medicating. Uh -huh. You're referring to something like self-medicating. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. You know, mm -hmm. I, I even see people in my family who go repetitively, but nothing's changing. Mm -hmm. We're still pointing the finger at someone. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm kind of making an observation in general. Not that it's not necessary, and definitely right. I suggest people go, and I, it saved my life for sure when I needed it. Yeah. But that everything that we should do should be moving us forward or mm -hmm. up or something, not just, otherwise we're just stuck in the same sort of place. Right. So I, I think um, I'm the time manager, so I'm going to focus yeah. myself here for a moment. Yeah. I think that's why when I look at this, going back to the system of the koshas, so this is from a different discussion, the physical body, the energetic body, the mental body, the intuition body, the experience of love. This is from your module last month when you were here. If we start this process of tamas, creating faith and accountability with your physical body, making actions that nurture the anamaya kosha, we start to realize that that changes the nervous system body. And it changes our relationship to our minds, and that changes our access to intuition and to love. Then we may start making changes that are looking at the nervous system. Mm -hmm. For example, I decide I'm going to hydrate and sleep better. I thought, oh, wow, I'm really feeling a lot better. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to just pick up your two things, but I did just then. <laughs> so now I'm feeling a lot better, and I think, you know, I'm feeling so much better, I don't really want to watch that much TV or be on Facebook that much. I'm going to tend to my nervous system and disconnect more often from technology. I think, wow, not only does my body feel better, but my nervous system feels better. And now I think I'm going to practice more auspicious thoughts, more auspicious mind states. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try on loving kindness as a daily practice. Oh. And you start to see the, the tools get more and more powerful as you get closer and closer to Anandamaya Kosha. But if we started with the physical tools, like if a therapist, a client comes to see the therapist, and they say, OK, great session. I'm going to ask you to hydrate now. When you come back next week, tell me how that goes. It doesn't often happen in the psychotherapy relationship. And is this in your training? To well, it is now that I train with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But are you using this? Well, yeah, because I use, we do really minimal things for self-care to mm -hmm. show that they are humans again. Because that, I mean, I'm get, we're getting people from off the street that yeah. are living, so eating something healthy, eating something warm, mm -hmm. making, that's your, your goal is to walk five minutes a day, you know? Yeah. You're really minute, but. Yeah, and I find that if I'm working at that level with somebody, this level, this really important foundational tamasic level, and it develops our relationship for them to do those things, now we have a more accountable relationship to each other, we have a lot more trust and confidence together, we can do this other work. But if I'm just working on their mind stuff right away, I, I may lose traction because it's very slippery, the mind stuff, and it's very tangible if you hydrated or how your bedtime was. Mm -hmm. So I like the tangible to get us started in our relationship. And I like the tangible to get this started here because the teapot has to be on the stove. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just remembered from my previous thought, I was going somewhere with that, but I totally forgot because I went somewhere deeper. Um, I was thinking about us as yoga teachers, right? And, and given that for me in my personal journey with movement specifically, that's where I'm at, what would you recommend for us as teachers and how the kind of environment that we set up for students? Mm -hmm. Do I set up a tamasic environment for students because that's where I'm at with my personal movement practice? Would it be unwise to go elsewhere mm -hmm. given where, where I'm at? So this is, I can, can speak to this for a minute and then we do have to close. 
Um, the tamasic environment as a yoga teacher means the stable container, the secure, safe, trustworthy environment. doesn't mean a dull or lethargic environment. So what is tamasic in that case may be things like you start the what is consistent. You start the class on time. The setup is relatively familiar each time. The the ambiance is relatively consistent. Your voice tone, your body presence is relatively consistent. You're not erratic. You're not unpredictable. People feel that they can trust your presence when you walk in the classroom. So those are tamasic things in the classroom. How you start, the next thing you might do or say. The rituals that are consistent provide that sense of security or safety. People start to feel it's familiar. What is rajasic then, once you get students in, in the, um, how shall I say, it's like once the students become a, a flock of birds in the sky, and you can sense we're on that sky circle together, once that's occurred, you can put a little rajas in the classroom, up-level it, challenge the students, but then bring them back down to that trust, safe, connected place. And when you challenge like this, it goes rajasic to masik, we hope to arrive in the sattvic state, inevitably, hopefully in the period of the class time. And you're looking at your students through the lens of sattva. You're looking at the students through the lens of lucid, clear, luminous compassion for the human condition. That should be overarching in your classroom. But since you know you have humans coming in, you're going to tend to their tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic needs. I can give you the curriculum we just used at the high school for a seven-week series. We had four classes a week for seven weeks, and it's based on the gunas. These are high schoolers. They, they have to learn what the gunas are, actually, in the class, but the teachers get the curriculum from me, and it says, do this, this is tamasic, now do this, it's rajasic, now do this, it's tamasic, try this, that's sattvic, and you'll see that I weave through the class tamas, rajas, and sattva. Their practices to evoke those states for the students. If that would be helpful, I can share it with you. Yeah, yeah. please. Cool. Yeah. Okay, it's nice to end on a yes like that. Do you want to have the other two? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's sit for a few moments on that yes that you just shared. Lisa, do you feel more hopeful? <coughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I know is yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I feel very stuck in, in chaos often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I don't feel like down, back down. But maybe the monkey. Yeah, the drug monkey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if the, the monkey. So if you look at the, the triune brain, that is your lizard brain, your mammal brain, your wise mind. Rick Hansen likes to say, with the lizard, the mouse, and the monkey. And, what he, and the monkey, he's talking, Lisa, about the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex. So this is your monkey brain, this is your mouse brain, your limbic brain, and then there's your lizard brain, your reptilian brain. And he says, hug the monkey, <laughs> feed the mouse, and pet the lizard. So we're going to sit for a couple minutes of quiet to hug the monkey. <laughs> This will not make sense out of context, so don't go home and tell your <laughs> friends that tonight at the Dharma study group we were going to hug the monkey. <laughs> what was the one after feed the mouse? Pet the Pet lizard. The lizard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pet the lizard means some movement touch to the autonomic nervous system. Feed the mouse means it doesn't need to be starving. Starving mice are anxious. And then pet, I mean, hug the monkey. Give it some comfort. Okay, you can rest your hands in your lap. Let your eyes close. If you prefer not to close your eyes, that is fine. You can look down quietly. That way the eyes are not a source of distraction. So whether your eyes are looking down or closed, take a few moments to internalize the companionship you have in the room here. And a few moments to realize the teachings of yoga available to us even hundreds of years after their development.
And then direct your awareness to your own heart, your sense of your heart in the center of your chest, your energetic heart. The word courage has as part of its root the the word that means heart. As you rest your attention in your heart, you may ask of yourself, what would be a clear action step that I may take to create that tamas or stability, to recreate a sense of faith in myself? And even if the answer that comes right now is silent, just know that you can ask the question of your clear heart, your courageous heart, what might be a wise action step? Join your hands together in Anjali Mudra. Thank you, everyone. Namaste.